Welcome to Walking by Faith, where we use the practical biblical teaching of God's Word to change lives around the world. We believe that God is relevant to every aspect of our lives, and we want to help you live a life that is both authentic and on fire for Jesus. If you'd like to follow along with Pastor's Notes, you can find them on our app. In today's message, Pastor Dwayne will explore two topics, the mysteries of UFOs and the question of why God doesn't just kill the devil. Let's jump into exploring the mysteries of the unknown. I want to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves. So I want to go back to the Old Testament to kind of kick this off. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there is the prophet Elisha. And he is operating in what the Bible refers to as the word of knowledge. And so he tells the king of Israel, he says, now the Syrian king is going to set an ambush for you in this place. So avoid it. Right? Now, now he knows this by the word of the Lord. And the Bible says that the prophet warns the king multiple times, not just once or twice. And so the king of Syria says, you know, who's, who's the traitor around here? And the Bible says in the 12th verse of the 6th chapter, 2 Kings, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that he speaks in, your, in his bedchamber. Well, he said, well, where is he that I can send and get him? And they said, well, surely he's in Dothan. So the king of Syria, he sends his army to go catch the prophet. And they surround the city at night. And in the morning when they get up, Elisha's servant goes out and he sees the army surrounding them and he knows what's going on. And so he says to the prophet, he said, what are we going to do? Look at, we are surrounded. And the prophet answered, he said, don't fear, for those that are with us are more than those that are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes, and the young man saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around. Now, the horses and chariots of fire, they were there before the the young man saw them. But what I want you to catch here is there's two realms. There's a natural realm, and there is a spiritual realm. And the spiritual realm can manifest itself in the natural realm. Uh, the Smithsonian Magazine, I've got an article here, I just want to read a little bit. It says, in 1896, newspapers throughout the United States began reporting accounts of mysterious airships flying overhead. Descriptions varied, but witnesses frequently invoked the century great technology, technological achievements. Such sources reported blimps powered by steam engines. Others saw motorized winged craft with screwed propellers. Many recalled flying machines equipped with powerful searchlights. Now, here's what they said. As technology of flight evolved, so did the description of the flying, unidentified flying objects. Now, here's what I want to, uh, what I believe with all my heart. I believe that there are such things as UFOs, but they are demonic. They are demonic manifestations. Now, notice how what they saw changed as technology changed, right? People kind of were on the edge, whatever the edge of technology was, that was the way that they manifested themselves. Now, it says here back in Kings that what they saw was they saw chariots and horses of fire. That was the most, that was, that was the best technology of the day. Remember, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the Bible says that there's two men on their way to Emmaus, and he appeared to them in a different form. He appeared to them in a different form. I think if you were to see those chariots of fire today, you probably wouldn't see a chariot of fire. You would see it in a different form. But that's the form at that time. So as technology has changed, because UFOs are not new, What people see has changed. 
And it's changing, they mention, as technology changes. Um, in Zechariah chapter 5 and verse 3, someone asked me, what do you see? And the prophet replied, I see a flying scroll. It's 30 feet long and it's 15 feet wide. We would basically say what he saw was a cigar flying in the sky. Right? That's what he saw. He saw like a cigar that was flying. That was the form that he saw. Right? Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, the working of Satan will be with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And then it says in the 11th verse, a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. A strong delusion. Um, the Bible says that, these, that, that there will be seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. If you read at all about the doctrine, people claim to have been taken by aliens and taught by aliens. Almost without exception, what you will find is their doctrine is the doctrine of devils. Right? Oh, we put Muhammad on earth. We put Buddha on earth. We put Jesus on earth. We're seeding the earth. We're trying to teach people. We're trying to help humanity. There are some people, I love this, there are some people that just are not going to go with the flow. And we're going to have to take those people and purge the earth of those people. You know what we call it? The rapture. It is literally an excuse or a way to, to talk about what the rapture happens when it happens. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 10, by the way, it says, the appearance of their working was as if it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they moved, they went forward in any one of four directions. Now, literally, uh, there's different artists rendering of it, but this is some sort of a device that he beings in heaven use as transportation. It's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now, exactly what it's going to look like, I don't know if anybody's got an exact, you know, um, unless they had a vision of it like Ezekiel did, what it is. But the Bible tells us what Satan will do. He will appear as an angel of light. And remember, these alien beings, when they talk, the, the, the doctrine that they bring is the doctrine of devils. That's exactly what it is. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which we have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, he says, you put up with it. But he says, let them be accursed. There is a different gospel. There is a different Jesus. There is a different spirit. And these beings come from a different dimension. They come from the spiritual dimension. They can appear and they can disappear. They do things that are physically in the natural dimension, they, they cannot be done. And are there other beings that God created? Well, the Bible talks about archangels, about seraphim, about cherubim, about the four living creatures, uh, about the four-faced beings. Absolutely, there are different beings that God has created, right? Um, Bill Crohn says this, UFO entities seem to have the ability to materialize and dematerialize as if they come from another doorway or portal, which just so happens to also be the ability of angels or angelic beings, which, of course, demons are. Only they're in the fallen category. Right? They rebelled against God with Satan, and they travel also through the dimension's doorway. Uh, People said, are there other planets? Well, well, you may have not have thought about this, but heaven is a planet. It's not a cloud. It's a planet. In, in Psalms 105, the Bible says that he satisfied them or gave them the bread of heaven. Manna was bread from heaven. Other translations, I love this, said the corn of heaven. So I figured it was cornbread, right? 
But if, if they had corn, they had, they had fields and they had crops. The Bible talks in Deuteronomy, the days of heaven, like the days of heaven above the earth. He's saying you can have days on, on earth that are like the days of heaven. But in heaven, listen, there's mountains, there's rivers, there's streets, there's mansions, there's trees, there's furniture, there's crops, there's food, there's tables, there's chairs. Uh, there, there is a tabernacle, there's musical instruments. Heaven is a planet. So is there life on other planets? Absolutely. And did God create other life? Absolutely. Absolutely he did. The Bible talks about all of those angels. And by the way, now they're telling us, you know, that we can look out into space billions of light years. You know, is there a planet out there with somebody on it? I don't know. But I do believe that throughout eternity, we are going to go and explore the, the universe that God has created. He didn't create it for no reason at all. Could there be somebody out there? There might be. There might be. So heaven is a planet. God did create other beings. And there is not just a natural realm. There is a spiritual realm. And I truly believe that all of the UFOs that people are seeing are manifestations that are demonic. They are demonic. Uh, John Engelbert said this then it is logical to conclude that UFOs constitute a demonic phenomena with a hidden agenda. After years of extensive depth, deep research, it constitutes a conclusion that has become a virtual certainty that UFOs constitute a spiritual demonic phenomena. A spiritual demonic phenomena. So they are real. And even demonically, if you, you look at, at uh, what, what the Bible teaches very clearly in Ephesians 6, in verse 12, it says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The living Bible says our, our battle is not against persons, but against beings without bodies. Right? There are spiritual beings. It says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. It actually mentions four different classes or types of demonic spirits. So are UFOs real? I believe that there are many of them that you can just, there's, there's a natural explanation. But I believe there are some that the only explanation is spiritual. It's a spiritual explanation. And they are demonic beings and they, are, they have come to deceive to deceive humanity. And then secondly, this is pretty good. I'm, 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 I'm within just like 10 seconds of getting that one done and having the same amount of time for the second one. All right, so the second one is, why doesn't God kill the devil? Why doesn't God kill the devil? You know, I think as, a, as a young Christians, many of us have this question. Like, God, if you would just kill the devil, take care of all our problems. In fact, kill the devil, invite all the demons to the funeral, and then kill all them, right? Everything's taken care of. Let's just get rid of the devil. So, so let me, let me uh, kind of unpack this. Jesus said this in John chapter 4. He said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is a spirit being. And, and I, because we're just talking about the, the demonic and, and UFOs, um, how many of you know that God has a body? Now, he's a spirit, but he has a body. Now, it's not a physical body. Moses said, I want to see your glory. And God said, let me put you here in this cave. And I'm going to put my hand over the cave. And I'm going to walk by. And then I'm going to take my hand away, and you can see my back. So does God have a body? Yeah, he does have a body. But it's not a physical body. It's a spiritual body. In 1 Thessalonians 5, the apostle Paul says, may, may the God of peace sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You also are a spirit. You have a soul or a mind. You live inside of a body. Now, someday that body is going to wear out. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
So the real you, when you're, well, we'll get into this a little more, but when, the re, when, when, when your physical body dies, the real you that lives on the inside does not die. The real you that lives on the inside steps out. And by the way, in Hebrews chapter one, it says he makes his angels spirits. Angels are also spirits. Now, how many of you realize that when an angel reaches 300,000 years old, they have to retire? No, they don't retire. Why? Because spirits don't get old, right? Uh, I'm, I'm 69, right? Uh, I remember when I was 35, I loved to race. I don't love racing anymore. In fact, you know, you know I kind of got this furniture disease where your chest moves into your drawers, you know? Some stuff is moving around, right? So the Bible says the outward man perishes. Your physical body gets old. And if Jesus tarries, someday your physical body will die. But then it says, but the inward man is made new every day. So, so you, you come to me and say, oh, you're old. Well, my body's old, but let me tell you something. Inside, I'm still 16. Right? So your, your physical body gets old, but the real you on the inside, you're a spirit, right? And spirits don't get old. So Jesus in Luke 16 uh, really kind of pulls back the veil for us to let us know a few things about the spiritual realm. He said, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom or at his side. And he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he put the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in torment in these flames. But Abraham said, son, in your lifetime, you received good things and likewise Lazarus things, but now he's comforted and you're tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify them, at least they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. And he said, no, Father Abraham. That's, that's all the farther that uh, we need to go. Now, notice Lazarus dies. They put his body in a pauper's tomb, but angels carry him. Angels carry him. So when your physical body dies, the real you that lives on the inside, the spirit is going to step out. And faster than the speed of light, angels are going to carry you. One of two places. The rich man, he also died and he's buried. And, and, and literally, he has, I believe, the, the most terrifying thought that any human being can ever have. He's dead, but in Hades, he like, I went to hell. I am in hell. Right? He lifts up his eyes. He sees Abraham and Lazarus, and he recognizes them. People wonder, in, in heaven, am I going to recognize people? Absolutely. Absolutely. You will recognize your loved ones. All right? You're going to spend time with your loved ones. Jesus says you're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob right, at the table in heaven. So they're recognized. But here's the thing that I want you to, to notice right away. The Bible says the rich man lifted up his eyes, and he saw Lazarus next to Abraham, and he cries out because he's in torment, right? And he says, just have him put the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue, I'm in torment in the flames, right? Now, the Bible says that he died and he was buried. Where is his body? 
It's in the ground. But in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, and he's in torment. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Right? So you are living inside a natural body right now. But your spirit that's inside that body also has a body. Right? And it looks just like you. Now, notice he lifts up his eyes and he sees Lazarus and he says, have him put the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Now, if if he has a finger, how many of you think he has a hand? And if he has a hand, he has an arm. And if he has a tongue, he has a mouth. If he's got a mouth, he's got eyes. He lifts them up and he sees. So your spiritual body is like your physical body. It's not a physical body, but it's like a physical body. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul said, I knew a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know how such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Again, the Bible talks about three heavens. One you would simply call the atmosphere. The second one you would call outer space. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. You you see some of these pictures from the Hubble telescope. How many of you know it's just like, wow. Wow. It declares the glory of God. That's what the Bible calls the heavens. The third heaven is a place, a planet where God lives. Right? So Paul said, I went to the third heaven. And then he says again, I don't know if I went in my body or out of my body. Now, how many of you think if you went to Costco without your body, you'd miss it? <laughs> you think that, but you probably wouldn't. Because when the real you steps out of your, your physical body dies and you step out, You're still going to see. You're still going to have hands. You're still going to have a mouth. You can still perceive pleasure. You can still perceive pain in that spiritual body. And and, and sometimes people think, well, you know, somebody dies, they're just like Casper the friendly ghost, just kind of floating around. No, that's not true, right? That's not true. So both the rich man and Lazarus died. Lazarus is in a place that's referred to as, there are three different ways in the Bible, by the way, Abraham's bosom or having a place next to Abraham. It's also called paradise, and it's called captivity. And you say, why is it called captivity? It's called captivity because these people are kept. They, they can't go to heaven because their sins haven't been paid for. Jesus has not come yet. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said like Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the fish. So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right? So in the heart of the earth, there are two compartments. One is called paradise, captivity, Abraham's bosom. The other one is called Hades. Now, by the way, Hades is not hell. But Hades is just like hell. But it's not hell. You say, what's the difference? The difference is it's like the difference between the county jail and the state penitentiary. Right? You get caught doing something, you go to the county jail. But you haven't gone to court. You haven't been found guilty. So then you go to court, and you're, if you're found guilty, you go to the state pen. How many of you know the county jail, state pen, they're similar, but there's a difference. There's a difference between Hades and hell. And the main difference is you haven't stood before the court of heaven yet, before the court of the universe. Right? So... Get that place back up there again, just for a second, all right? So the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, says this. Therefore, when he ascended on high, he gave, he led captivity captive. That, that top place, paradise, Abraham's bosom, captivity. All of the righteous saints from the Old Testament are being held in that place because their sins haven't been paid for. Um. I've used this illustration before, but I don't know of a better one. When I was about five years old, my parents took me to Robert Hall. I remember Robert Hall. All you old people, lift your hands. All right. It was this clothing store down on 28th Street. All right. And we, 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 we chose a suit, the first suit I ever had. All right. But we didn't have the money to pay for it. So we put it on layaway. I think we put down $5. All right. And then we came back like a week or two later and put down another $5. And then we came back like a week or two later and put down another $5, which paid for all of it, by the way, 15 bucks for a suit. That's pretty expensive, right? And then we got to take it home. 
but we couldn't take it home until it was paid for. And this was before credit cards, and they called it layaway. Well, God had all the Old Testament saints on layaway. Their sins hadn't been paid for, so God couldn't take them to heaven. Romans 3, by the way, talks about this, how God had to send Jesus to be just and the justifier of those that had sinned. So when Jesus arises from the dead, he led captivity captive. He took all of those people in a train up to heaven. Now, he is, now this he ascended. What does it mean that, else, that, that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended, that's Jesus, is also the one who ascended above the heavens that he might fill all things. But when Jesus arose from the dead, he did not arise alone. In fact, the Bible, I believe it's in the book of Matthew, tells us that when Jesus arose from the dead, that many people, saints, who had been buried around Jerusalem were seen walking in the city. Now, your Uncle John, who's been dead for 25 years, when Jesus arose from the dead, the Bible refers to this, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 15, says the first roots. It was to prove that when Jesus arose from the dead, he didn't just have the power to bring himself out of the dead, from the dead. He had the power to bring everybody with him. Right, called the first fruits, by the way. Okay, So these people that had been dead for years are seen walking around Jerusalem. So the place called captivity, paradise, it's empty. But Hades is still there. It is still there today. And by the way, the man says, hey, send them to my brothers. At least they also come to this place of torment. And he said, well, they've got... They've got Moses and the prophets. They've got the Bible. And he said, no. The reason he's there is because he would not believe the word of God. He wouldn't believe the word and change. So because angels and Satan are spirits, they cannot die. So the Bible says in Jude, the first chapter, only chapter, sixth verse, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And then it compares what these angels did to what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, notice these fallen angels. It says that he has reserved them in everlasting chains of darkness. God did not destroy them or annihilate them because they're spirits. And spirits can't die. So God put them in everlasting chains of darkness. And by the way, what it's talking about here, where it says the angels who didn't keep their proper domain, it's talking about Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, and the King James says, and there were giants also in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, And the same became mighty men, men of old, men of renown. A couple different translations. And in those days, and even afterwards, when evil beings from the spirit world were sexually involved with human women, their children became giants, of whom many legends are told. Another translation, in those days, giants lived on the earth and also afterwards, when divine beings and human daughters had sexual relations and gave birth to children. And these were the ancient heroes, famous men. Um, By the way, a a hero is, in Greek mythology, half God and half human. Half God, half human. Uh, One more translation. "And And the children of supernatural beings who had married these women became famous heroes and warriors. They were called the Nephilim, and they lived on the earth at that time and even afterwards. Um, That Genesis 6, 4, literally for 2,500 years, everybody believed the exact same thing. Jews and Christians all believed that demonic beings had sexual relationships and produced a race, but not human. They produced a, a race of super beings, giants, heroes, right? Uh... It wasn't until about the year 400 when Augustine, the bishop of Hippo, 
came out with a, a different explanation and just said it was the sons of Seth having uh, relationships or, or, or marrying uh, the sons of Cain, uh, which, again, 2,500 years after it's written, there's only, one, there's only really one uh, interpretation. There were spiritual beings that had sexual relationships and produced a race of beings that were not completely human. Not completely human. So with that said, we've got to finish this up. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children, that's you, that's me, that's human beings, the daughters of Abraham, of, of Adam, inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. You live in a flesh and blood body. He, Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through death, he might destroy or paralyze him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So in order to redeem you, Jesus had to come in a flesh and blood body just like yours. Right? If he was to redeem you, he had to come in a body like your body to destroy him that had the power of death or paralyze him. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For he does not give aid or salvation to angels. But he does give aid or salvation to the seed of Abraham. Because angels, including Satan, do not have a physical body, they cannot be saved. Because your redemption is tied to the fact that you live in a flesh and blood body And Jesus came in a flesh and blood body exactly like yours. And he can only, listen, Jesus can only redeem you while you live in a flesh and blood body. So in Ecclesiastes 11 and 3, it says, if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. Now, it's not talking about trees. It's talking about people. When you die, you fall. You are either right with God or you're not right with God. And the way you die, you are sealed for all eternity. You're either right with God or not right with God. You see, because you can't repent after you die because Jesus redeemed you in a flesh and blood body. And you can only receive what he did for you while you live in a flesh and blood body. That's the reason that the devil can't be saved because he doesn't have a flesh and blood body. He can't be saved. And the reason he can't die and God can't kill him is because he's a spirit. That's why when the spirit beings were disobedient and crossed the line, God didn't kill him. He put him in everlasting chains of darkness. There was an eternal punishment. By the way, the Bible talks about the devil, Revelation 20.10. He's thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death, and he will be tormented day and night forever and ever, right? Listen, every spirit has a forever and ever future. Whether it's an angel, whether it's the devil, whether it's you or whether it's me, we have a forever future, right? And you can only be redeemed, get right with God, have your sin paid for while you live in that flesh and blood body. You know, the Bible is God's word. It is God speaking to us. And we often say the Bible has the answers to all of life's questions. And it does have all the answers. But the Bible also has the greatest questions. Let me just give you a few of them. For example, the Bible asks this question, what is your life? Now, if I were to ask some people, what's your life? Somebody would say, well, my life's happy. Somebody else would say, my life's a wreck. Somebody would say, my life's my family. Somebody would say, well, my life is my job. Somebody might say, my life's going nowhere. But the Bible answers the question and says, your life is but a vapor that's here for a moment and it's gone. Uh, we live in the North Country. And in the winter, you go outside and you breathe and you can see your breath. It's a vapor. And in two, three seconds, it's gone. The Bible says, in light of eternity, the time that you're going to spend here on this earth, in this physical body that you're living in, it's just like a few seconds. It's just a vapor and it's gone. The next question 
the Bible asks is this, what will the end be? What will the end be? Now, the, by the way, it is multiple choice, but there's only two choices. The end, when your body wears out and dies, you're either going to spend an eternity with God. We refer to that as heaven. Or you're going to spend an eternity separated from God, which is referred to as hell. There are no other options. And then in the book of Acts, there's a man who's been a jailer, and he comes to the apostle Paul, and this is his question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do? You see, there is something you need to do, and it's receive what God has done for you. Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, and paid for your sin. He died and rose again, victorious over death. And if you need forgiveness, and everyone does, Jesus is the only Savior. He paid for your sin. And the Bible says, to as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to be the children of God. Now, I want to pray with you to receive Jesus. If you don't know where you stand with God, you're away from God, I'm, gonna, I am, I'm begging you, pray this prayer from your heart and give Jesus your heart and life and receive him as your king and your savior. So I want you to make these words your own. Pray this prayer out loud. Say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. I, I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. I receive Jesus as my King and my Lord, and I'm going to live for him. And I thank you. You've heard my prayer. I'm forgiven. My past is gone. I'm a part of your kingdom and your family today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, We have written a book especially to help you keep on growing in your spiritual life. Want to get it to you absolutely free. All the information is right there on your screen. And thank you so much for being with us today. God bless. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Duane, congratulations. You're making one of the best decisions of your life. We're so excited for you. Just like Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv where you can have a copy mailed to you, download it instantly, or check out our audiobook. You can also find all these things in our app. This free book is a great resource as it's full of practical advice and encouragement to help you live a life of faith. Claim your free copy today. Walking by Faith is changing lives and we want you to be a part of it. Your gift will help us continue to produce inspiring content that encourages people to change the way they think and empowers them to use their voice. When you sow into God's kingdom, He will pour out His blessing upon you just like it says in Malachi 3.10. There are three easy ways to give. Text WBFGIVE to 1-888-364-GIVE. Visit walkingbyfaith.tv slash give or click on the giving icon in our app. Thank you for your support. Thanks for watching. We'd love to get to know you better. By scanning this QR code, you can download our app, send us a prayer request, read our weekly devotionals, follow us on social media, and so much more. To rewatch today's episode with closed captions, you can now find us on Rumble. I know these are big questions, and there are no easy answers. But I hope that this sermon has given you something to think about. If you have more questions, please contact us. Adios y los vemos pronto.